Sure. Right. So wonderful. This is uh, thank you so much for you? your time and, and thank you for, for the patience that you've had with me constantly having to cancel our appointment again because I've I've just had a bit of a rough ride with being ill a lot the last 18 months. <laughs> Come, comes with the territory well, of that's, the little one in school. That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. I am um, pleased to talk to a human being about saving the planet. <laughs> so that's quite good. So uh, it's well worth the wait, I'm sure. I, I think we might be better off with the um, mic on your computer. Something is not uh, that great. If, if you unplug your headphones and, and just use the one on your computer, it's probably because there's something. Uh, is that any better? Yeah, that's better, actually. That is better. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. That's fine. Great. Um, yeah. I, your work has really been giving me some of the key scaffolding to develop the way that I started thinking about all this when I did my PhD on design for human and planetary health. Um, in particular, like I'm not actually that familiar with the work that you did sort of past 2005. Um, just because I, you send me some some amazing books that I haven't had time to, to read yet, the uh, positive development book I'm really looking forward to reading. But it was this um, you probably recall that you you, you edited a wonderful, um, I think it was in 2002 with EarthScan, a, a green, slightly larger format book that was um, called Ecological Solutions. Um, and it had... No, um, I, you're right, but mm -hmm. it was called Design for Sustainability. And, I... and um, yeah, I... it was my teaching materials from the 1990s. Mm -hmm. And um, it was intended to juxtapose different positions somewhat on different sustainability issues as a teaching tool. Uh, but I used it um, later on with uh, students that, you know, were not maybe particularly at a high level. And they were always surprised to hear that we were talking about all those things back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, that they they thought in 2015 were new, yeah. you know. I mean, uh, that, bioregionalism and all that. Yeah, yeah. No, I and mean, that was the amazing thing about this book because you really pulled like you, it was quite centered around the bioregional approach, which um, corrobor like I I had just been at Schumacher College and met people that you pulled together in this um, collection, so I. I'd been directly taught by David Orr and John Todd was my second PhD supervisor. And I met um, Hardin Tips wow. when he was doing his industrial ecology spiel around the world. And so, um, and Amory Lovins came and taught at Schumacher College and, and, and um, Paul Hawke and I knew through Bioneers. So I was just amazed that you had pulled all these elders together in, in, in one compendium. And particularly what, what I thought was a stroke of genius to... Um, help us mentally integrate what needs to be integrated was this the scales of design um, like in the opening of, of that compendium you wrote a short piece where in in order to structure all these different perspectives and contributions you um, proposed these I think it was seven scales of design from kind of material science to product design to architecture to community de design to um, industrial ecology and then bioregional planning and, and and also that integrated everything within a bioregional context um that was hugely helpful for me then no well, that's that's good um yeah i don't actually even remember that but i was teaching um multidisciplinary classes so i was teaching some of my students would be landscape designers, architects, industrial designers, um, sometimes the occasional engineer. Mm -hmm. um, that continued over the, the years. I, I've taught a lot of multidisciplinary courses. Um, your background is very multidisciplinary. Your, your own oh, yeah. 
Yeah, I did. Maybe we start by you telling a little bit of of of, of your story because I, it's it's always nice to hear how people got into this and 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 what path they took. Well, how I got into it, um, it's a long story. It's about as old as I am. Um, I began my PhD in planning for sustainability in 1981, mm -hmm. but I had always been captivated by the built natural environment, and I was interested in sustainability as a young child. Um, in the early 1950s, we did know that the Amazon was threatened and that species were going extinct, and I was very protected post-war child. I was born at the end of the war, uh, knew nothing about it. It was comfortable little suburban uh, life in the middle of the U.S. Uh, but even I knew that uh, species were in trouble. And, and uh, one incident I remember when I was about seven or eight, I, I was an avid bird watcher, an archer, and a butterfly collector. And um, one day I downed a butterfly with an arrow and I barely stunned it. And it was an interesting butterfly I hadn't seen before. Well, the neighbor was an entomologist and I found out that it was endangered. So it brought things home. Um, if you grew up in a small suburb in the middle of the U.S. back in the 50s, you thought everything happened a long way away, you know. Um, so I also, because I was interested in, I was an experiential type. That's, sorry, that's my, um, okay, I don't know even. It's a new phone. I was pushing the wrong button to turn it off. Um, so I kind of knew that society was a social construction. I was kind of aware of that because my parents would always, I'd ask, why do we do this? And they'd say, because it's the done thing, you know, and they were much, very much into fitting into society as we know it. And so I kind of became aware that things didn't have to be one particular way or the other. And I also, as I started to say, I was really keen. I was experiential and I was just always outdoors and interested in buildings and natural environments. And I think I sort of intuitively knew that, that the key to saving the natural environment was the built environment. Um, leaving aside militarism for the moment, you know. Um, now, we didn't actually get facts and figures about the built environment uh, until the 1990s. Um, there really was very little information. I was looking for it because I was teaching and uh, we also knew biodiversity was disappearing, but we didn't know till recently that we've lost over 70% of the global biodiversity in 70 years. Um, and these facts just weren't really available because no one understood the importance of the built environment to biodiversity, social justice, and sustainability in general. Would you say Go no, ahead. Would you say no one, or because the, the, the people that would come to my mind oh. that were pioneers at that time would have been Patrick Geddes in Cities and Evolution, oh. 1910, right. it was written, and then influenced Mumford and Geddes influenced Mumford, and Mumford influenced Ian. Yeah. So that those three, Geddes, Mumford, and Ian. Well, yes, we kind of got. And I was actually, I was aware of Mumford. Uh, I grew up next to Mumford Street, named after him. Um, and early on, I was into, uh, I became aware of Ian McCarg and Jane Jacobs. Um, 
some to... other oh yes of course i didn't mean to say nobody i meant that in general it just wasn't something that was researched yeah. yeah um there were i mean there were always uh individuals around who were very uh switched on but just in terms of the press i mean we didn't have ai we didn't have google uh you could only find out these sorts of subjects by going to a library physically, filling out a card, waiting for the librarian to come back with a trolley full of books. Um, but now we know that construction will probably result in a threefold increase in things like energy consumption and emissions, not to mention everything else in 30 years. So we really need to change the environment the built environment in a radical way. And um, my view of the built environment, even though I didn't understand material flows and um, issues like that, um, was, you know, I like climbing trees and I wanted to live in a house that was totally integrated with nature. And I sort of thought, oh, buildings should be like native gardens. And of course, Frank Lloyd Wright kind of was moving in that direction long, uh, long before. And, um, but um, I wanted to major in some environmental field. And I, first of all, I was told that women couldn't do science. But second, when I did look into it, it seemed to all be about managing nature. Like you looked at the subjects, I didn't think I could pass any of them because they didn't look interesting. And um, so I had been good at art uh, all my childhood and got a lot of recognition for it. And I thought the safe thing to do would be to just major in art. But I went to a progressive art school called Bennington. That was a girls school. And um, I, things were opening up. So then I did a master's of architecture at Berkeley and I wasn't too impressed with Berkeley. It was uh, during the 1968 um, issues, the riots and all that. So we weren't really learning a lot, but I was exposed to the divide between that sort of technocratic, hard, mechanistic, position and the soft, wussy environmental design, uh, that dichotomy. Um, and I did some planning courses, which also actually discussed that cultural divide. And so with my- Quick, quick question, because the, of the timing. Yes. Around, around that time that you were in Berkeley, um, you know that John and Nancy and Bill McClarney and all the the original founders of the New Alchemy Institute um, actually founded the institute initially while John was still at um, uh, Woods not no Woods Hole the the one in California near um, is it Woods Hole the the um, Marine Lab. Um, what? Oh. The, down well, in Woods Hole Marine Lab, I think, it's on the other side of the country. I know. Then, Maybe then I'm it's, wrong. It's, then it was, it, I always get scripts in Woods Hole mixed up. One of them is on the East Coast and one of them scripts, is on the Scripts, yeah. Coast. I mean scripts. So, yeah, so, yeah. so people think that the new Alchemy Institute, because they moved shortly after they moved over to the East Coast to Woods Hole, um, they, they think it was founded over there, but it was actually founded in San Diego um, uh, when, when they were working at Scripts. And did it was there any because because of the kind of movement of the the cultural um, current that that you were describing um, that was going on in California at the time were you aware of these guys or did you learn about them later? Uh, no, I I don't think I had ever heard of them at that stage. Um, I was very impressed by uh, their work when I did find out about it. Mm -hmm. um, um, that's, the I, that's the that's the 
they just, sorry to interrupt again, just briefly. That's the curious thing that a lot of younger listeners might not even understand that at the time it was possible that some people were doing cutting edge stuff in San Francisco and others were doing it 400 kilometers further south and you exactly. wouldn't just do a little search and say who well, else thinks like me and and then no, you wouldn't know you, you could literally be that's exactly right Sorry. uh I, I ran a conference in 1995 and brought transdisciplinary people in sustainable design together and that was about the only way you could do it really is at conferences that were advertised by snail mail and posters. Um, so it was very, very slow. It, I would say all the ideas were there, but most people wouldn't find out about them or make connections with other people that were into the same thing. I, uh, when I was at Berkeley, Oh, what's it? Christopher Alexander was there, which is kind of the opposite end, the mathematical kind of pattern approach. Um, but anyway, I went to work as an advocacy planner in low-income communities around San Francisco. And that was what's now called co-design and community participation and design and placemaking and regeneration and all those um, sustainability terms. Um, it was to help to work with people, not in any kind of top-down relationship or anything, to help them protect and improve their own neighborhoods from brutalist forms of redevelopment that were still going on. And uh, that working at that scale uh, I kind of realized after seven years that we were stopping bad development in some cases from ruining cohesive neighborhoods that um, Jane Jacobs would have liked. But the banks we were stopping were funding, you know, we'd stop a branch bank in a neighborhood and that same bank would be funding large scale planetary destruction elsewhere. So it to me it was like whack a mole, it, you know that game where you because just problems popping up all the time where the there was this tsunami of destructive development uh, in um, around that time in particular. So I upscaled and went to work as an urban designer for the city of San Francisco. And I was for a while in charge of uh, development, major project review. So I was kind of assessing development and working with developers to try to get them to put in a green roof or, you know, we had, we had a pretty progressive urban design policy that aligned with sustainability in, in many ways. Um, but, um, yeah, I decided to to try to understand the impediments because as planners, we couldn't do much but negotiate between very active community groups back then and city hall and big developers. We, um, they were the community groups were really quite active in trying to stop bad development, which was uh, impressive. So I did a law degree on the side. Uh, because environmental protection was all happening in law in the early 70s. That's before developers kind of caught on to how to use law to do the opposite. So everything was happening, environmental assessment, water uh, protection, all these things. So I did the law degree and there were a lot of opportunities in San Francisco if you were transdisciplinary because that was something that was appreciated in the, uh, well, by that time, it would have been the uh, the 70s, mm -hmm. uh, late 70s, but I realized they really didn't like cities or buildings. 
And that's so I ended up in Tasmania. <laughs> yeah, I find that so fascinating. The the journey from art into architecture and planning, and then to actually understand that to move upstream to influence policy and and set the rules of the yeah game the governance. Policy. Uh, go central governance issue. Um, the, I just wanted to do another kind of um, context check because we're now in the middle 70s, eight, late 70s. Um, did you have any connection at the time with, like I have an interview in this series with David Hankey, who um, organized the first North American Bioregional Congress um, and um, was quite close with Gary Snyder and, and Peter Burke and Raymond Dasman and um, because they were all in your neck of the woods in, in, in San Francisco area, the, the Planet Drum Foundation and that first bioregional uh, American. Uh, I don't think I did. I don't think I really, uh, we, I mean, we had regional planning, but we didn't have bioregional planning. Uh, I don't think I, I don't really remember, but I don't think I came across it till the 1980s when I was doing my PhD and um, uh, getting exposed to um, more literature. And in Tasmania, to find any book on sustainability, you wouldn't necessarily look for a word like bioregional if you hadn't come across. There were, I do remember now, there were... Um, there were books on bioregional planning, but uh, but uh, by the Island Press, mm -hmm. yeah, um, mostly yeah. out of British Columbia, I thought. Yeah. There were, there were... Um, so I'm not sure when I not sure when I came across those, but um, and in Ta yeah, in Ta I um in, in Tasmania, did you did sorry. You... When you were in Tasmania, did you connect with Bill Mollison? Because that's also the early, like that's. Uh, well, I, I, I did. I came across him, but not personally. Um, but there was a very good environmental movement in Tasmania. That's where Bob Brown got started, and, and in fact, he was the first person I met when I moved to Tasmania. Um, and he's still. He's now. He was in Parliament. For years and now has uh, a foundation. He's sort of quasi retired and doing what he likes to do, which is direct action and uh, things that make a difference. So uh, it wasn't very easy to meet other Tasmanians, I must say. Um, but uh, there was a, a very progressive environmental movement, and I was there uh, when. The, the Franklin Dam issue arose. And um, I was raising kids um, and writing a thesis and building nature playgrounds. Um, so I really spent the 80s um, kind of, in, in a manner of speaking, well, in the sustainability movement in Tasmania, um, I, my thesis was, um, I used an ecofeminist paradigm to deconstruct the environmental management, planning and governance uh, system and to propose uh, a different approach um, using basically saying we really needed a constitution that integrated uh, nature and well what i call the ecological base or the natural environment and the public estate or the built environment um uh, not the private uh so much but um that so we needed a new constitution because the i i thought the u.s constitution was pretty good i did U u.s constitutional law in the u.s and Australian constitutional law in Australia. And the Australian constitution is just an administrative document that doesn't correspond to the actual system of governance that he's, has evolved. 
there's a lot of problems with the U.S. Constitution, but they were trying to develop means of avoiding the abuse of power and corruption. So I, I thought that was pretty important. But they weren't aware of the ecology back then, and uh, they weren't too good on social justice. So I, I proposed a different approach. And uh, then when I finished the thesis, I started teaching and uh, teaching architecture. And um, yeah, that was quite interesting. You wouldn't believe that in the 90s, there was really a lot of hostility towards sustainability. And I had colleagues saying, you shouldn't be teaching sustainable architecture because our students might graduate and they won't know how to do other kinds of architecture. Mm -hmm. They'll be at a, you know, at a loss. Uh, and lots of comments like that over the years that, that has changed, but uh, kind of more or less went underground. So, there, you know, there's that cultural split in architecture between the kind of technocratic energy efficiency people at best, you know, monumentalists at worst, and then the green designers who are pretty open to, um, well, at least things like passive solar design, you know, pretty fundamental stuff and greening of the environment, if not integrating nature with uh, the environment and with the built environment actually increasing nature, not just replacing what it's destroyed. Were you, so were that you, was uh, education for me. Were you at RMIT by then or um, where, where were you? Uh, no, I, well, I started out briefly at the University of Tasmania, which, um, was really, they were pretty good. The students there were um, pretty good and open and had a lot of fun uh, with with them doing creative sorts of, um, I, I can't go into all of that detail. Uh, University of Canberra was, um, yeah, I would say uh, very hostile towards sustainability at the time. And, um, yeah, that, that was, um, I didn't grow, I, I grew up thinking that if I went to work in a university, I'd be able to engage and debate. I never opened my mouth, but they saw my publication list and some of my earlier papers said like an ecofeminist analysis of, mm -hmm architecture or something and of course they didn't know what it meant but they thought it must have to do with witchcraft or something i imagine so uh you know like it was uh really bizarre what i what i came to understand is that the biggest barrier to sustainability on that kind of personal level is prejudice mm. because so many people are opposed to things and therefore they won't read it or try to understand it or even ask you know they will just undermine and you know play dirty politics and stuff so that that was uh um quite quite remarkable um so anyway then I published my first book, um, and the, the one you read. Um, but after that, in fact, after I sent it to the printers and it was too late to change anything, I tried, I became aware that um, even the most sustainable design that we were thinking in terms of um, was not really addressing global overshoot as it's sometimes called. Um, at the very best, it was, uh, well, at the worst, it was just reducing negative impacts as we all know, but 
but at the best, it was simply cleaning up the damage that had been done. And usually not from a whole life cycle perspective. They weren't thinking of the damage during resource extraction, you know, the full life cycle, the embodied energy, the embodied biodiversity and embodied resources. They were only thinking of leaving the environment better than it was before construction. Um, society at large is now getting to that point. I think in England now they have biodiversity uh, regulations where you know you have to put back more biodiversity than was lost or than was there but that's still not beginning to address the whole system impacts and um, so my 2008 book was basically saying we have to increase nature in real terms uh, not just do more good than bad um and that that's the book positive development yeah yeah it, what, what's what's and then that's hmm? sorry go yeah ahead. continue we can get we can get to that after the, the st story you, you continue no no uh i i Okay, I don't it, it, have well, a story. <laughs> well, what, 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 what I was interested in, to highlight a little bit because a lot of the people who are, for example, Regenesis Group trained, um, the one of the distinctions between um, what is regenerative and what is uh, still the old practice of sustainability that that Regenesis Group and Carol Sanford like to. Uh, highlight is that Kara Sanford speaks about um, the four co-present paradigms in the modern world um, of how, how we do things. There's still quite a lot of people who are in the extract value paradigm. Just simply let's extract, we can make money with it, and that's the justification. Yeah? Um, the next one is arrest disorder, understanding that that's a incredibly destructive and suicidal project, the first one. So they move a little bit into, well, we can still extract value, but we can do it in a way that doesn't create quite so much damage. Um, and then the, the next one is do good. And the danger would be that people would put your work with positive development only into the do good basket because then the next uh, the next evolution from that would be in in, in Cairo Sanford's way is rege uh, uh, regenerate um and how she distinguishes that is that it's not just about what they not, was now getting popular with net positive have a overall positive impact with what you do and then that justifies it and supposedly makes it regenerative but what i hear in your work and know the, as much as i know of you were you, you said this early you started in participatory community development when you were still in 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 california and i think all the way through also through your study of law and how policy works what what, what i'm sensing is that the the way of work you were engaged in is actually regenerative in the sense that it is specific to a unique locality and a unique place and a unique culture with its unique legal system and so on. It's trying to engage the people to help somewhat unveil and and manifest the potential that is actually in a place. And and that's that's what the 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 one of the key distinctions between the traditional sustainability approach and the regeneration approach is that it is more about capacity building and people's ability to keep learning and transforming their built environment or their 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 local place um, in response to life's changing patterns. It's not a sort of solutioneering approach of, oh yeah, we've made this holistic, integrated design, and now we're going to plonk it here, and then we're finished, and we hand over the key, and that's done. It, it's it's building the... With everything you do, you build the Excellently. capacity for the community to learn. So, sorry, over to you. Uh, well, it's just that 
my work has been deliberately misrepresented. Um, that came out through um, and and accidentally misrepresented. But my from about 2002, I started critiquing sustainable design. And um, net positive was not a good term, but it was the best term I could think of to say absolutely not in the narrow accountancy approach of more good than bad. That was conventional sustainability. Sustainability is a whole system concept. So when you say net positive sustainability, that means you've got to have a real improvement overall in nature and environmental justice. So it's I use the baselines, very gen generally speaking, of uh, should be nature better off than pre-urban pre conditions, pre-industrial conditions not just better than the site the way it was <laughs> in the past, which was a regenerative approach. And that it needed to leave, a development needed to leave a whole region better off, not just the stakeholders, the occupants and the neighbors. Mm -hmm. And um, what, there are several incidents, people got the net positive term directly from me and went off and used it differently. For instance, someone told me, an insider of the LBC, that he persuaded, he had read my book, uh, the 2008 one, and, and told the LBC that they should use net positive as a concept. So they use net positive waste. How do you do net positive waste doesn't make any sense. Net positive energy, and they're talking about sending energy across property lines. That doesn't make any sense. And net positive water, you can create water, but basically it's a closed earth system. You can't be net positive. I mean, uh, there are, are ways you can, in my view. But in other words, they were using net positive in a ridiculous, non-sustainable Con con and then at a conference, I talked to a businessman and, well, actually, I didn't talk to him directly, but he heard about my work through a friend, got the book, and went and is involved with Forum for the Future and used the term net positive business. And what he was talking about just meant benign business, you know, or maybe beyond benign business. And that took off, and and um, so mm -hmm. net positive took off not because of me, because no one read my work, but the term. I was the first to use the term, as far as I know. I spread it around, but the people who picked it up didn't even know what sustainability was, and in the whole system, since you and I would consider it, and changed the meaning. Uh, that's true of sustainability too. One reason people develop retronyms like regenerative is that sustainability, um, as everyone knows, was a lot more progressive before the Brutman Report yeah. uh, changed it into a democratic concept. And I got a lot into a lot of trouble in. 87, 88 for criticizing the Brentland Report because uh, it is sad that progressives, I, I mean, they do cancel people. There is very, I mean, sort of the, the right wing, but people in general, and I think more today than in the past, can't uh, refuse to engage with ideas if they think that it's not part of their tribe's uh, creed. Um, and so I like what you're doing because you're trying to engage and bring out differing views and ideas. Um, I, you know, back when I was in high school, we had debates. Um, I don't know how much that's done anymore, but certainly there's no debating. I mean, parliament is just catcalling. Um, the U.S. Congress is just nowadays lying. I mean, there's no actual jury system. Oh, part of my PhD was 
to have a, a kind of a public jury system on big environmental issues, mm -hmm. not necessarily where a jury makes a final decision or whatever, but where uh, you actually have to contest the evidence. You have to hear the evidence on both sides. Um, so, yes, the term net positive was a poor choice of words. It was the best I could think of at the time. And um, it, it's been um, perverted by many. This is, and this that's just... I mean, this, yeah. is, this is what's happening now really rapidly with the term regenerative. Um, I mean, I didn't coin the gen, uh, term regenerative. I mean, Buckminster Fuller used it in, in a particular way. Um, J.T. Lyle with um, regenerative development for human ecosystems used it in the in the late 80s, um, early 90s. Uh, yeah. Um, nice. And then Carol Sanford and, and the people in the Regenesis group have a almost 30 year practice of, of working with regenerative development in a particular way. Um, but I probably with my, my book and my social media advocacy work helped to um, sort of fan that flame that had been going on for a long time and, and, and help to bring it to a larger audience. But with that has also come exactly what you're describing, that pe lots of people are sort of semi-understanding it and realizing that this is this is a, a breath of fresh air in a stale kind of meaningless sustainability conversation because that term had been co-opted previously. Um, and, and now we get this ridiculous situation that people just change the adjective, but continue what they were doing. They're just saying, oh yeah, I've been doing regenerative all along. I just called it differently. And so they changed the adjective. And 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 and, and one of the, the things that like, because language use, when you, when you really like, apart from these, I mentioned earlier that these scales of design that, that, that you proposed in that um, Design for Sustainability book, you, you're right, the subtitle is called Ecological Solution something or other, but the title is um, it, at least the, the version I've got. Um, but so, so those scales help me integrate things in a spatial scale way. Then the work of Buzz Holling and Gunderson and so on with, with Panaki and um, the adaptive cycle helped me bring in the temporal scale linking, how certain things happen fast in small areas and slower in larger areas and, and very slow on a planetary cycle scale. And, um, and then the other important, and is a long preamble to what I'm actually trying to say, is this concept of meta design that if we look at design just as material objects out there and we don't pay attention to how our worldview our paradigm our narrative about who we are and what's worth doing um is influencing how we do these designerly things out there then we actually miss the most influential interference point, a, a, a leverage point in the entire system, which is paradigms and beyond paradigms, according to the Donella Meadows, and or education, like changing the core narrative of a culture changes everything. And, and one of the, the like I've noticed, and in, in, in it's we all do this, I do this even, like the, the way we use the word nature, and you've used it a couple of times um, in, in, in this conversation, is very often like leaving nature better off, leaving overall, but it, it still lands in most people as if nature was this other opposed to urban development, buildings, human infrastructure, even technology. And I, th I personally think that we need to change the narrative of who we are in relationship to nature in the sense that the highest form of human participation in this nested dynamic complexity that we call nature or life as a planetary process. Um, the highest form of participation in that is for us to become expressions of place again, like we have been for 290,000 years before um, the last 10,000 years where we started to kind of develop the 
power over separation from nature through agriculture and then the industrial revolution and so on. Um, what, but, it, but you, what, you know, the re I, I need to say, uh, though, I, I was liberated to use the word nature because as an academic, mm -hmm. nature was too soft and wussy and didn't sound scientific enough. So no one used the word nature. And I would actually have where I did say nature, you get an editor questioning like the word, you know. So we all said ecological, this and that and the other. And it's really only recently now that nature and of course all environmental uh, philosophers, you know, uh, everyone I know is against the nature person divide. Um, but I find it empowering to, to say nature now. And of course, there's this big movement, Nature Positive. I just edited a bunch of papers on Nature Positive, and they really only mean nature restoration. But this is such a big change for business because business uh, never really thought of looking at its supply chain and undoing the damage that it had done to nature. So I know what you mean about the um, not playing into or reinforcing these uh, dualisms, but, at the, but there's the other side of it is that it's now okay to say, um, to use words like nature, uh, emotion, whatever, mm. you know. Um, but, so, I mean, I've never, I've never accepted the nature uh, human divide, even when I was young. Um, however, my audience has been technocrats, whereas I think your audience are lay people. And I, after working as an advocacy planner, I really felt we had to move. I mean, of course, you want to continue to do all things in all, all ways, but to move from, from not just doing bottom-up planning or top-down planning, but top-up planning. How do you influence the, the influencers who were totally ignoring the environment movement? So I was sort of trying to speak their language, but I also felt that, um, I used to say we measure all the wrong things in all the wrong ways. Mm -hmm. And, you know, technocrats and business and everyone have to measure things and assess things. And I came to accept that. But when I would say that line, um, one time someone walked up to me and said, oh, you're the crazy lady that doesn't believe in measurement, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so um, it's really hard to communicate uh, on, on this level, but my point of view, and I think this is where I'm a little bit different, um, um, I don't, I try to change the minds of technocrats with reason rather than um, persuade sort of lay people with uh, spirit spirituality or, or whatever you want to uh, say, because that's not my role. I don't have the personality to uh, spread spirituality. I'll leave that to others. Um, my approach was to change the mindsets, models, methods, and metrics of environmental governance, planning, decision-making, and design, mm -hmm. and trying to articulate that um, as clearly as I could, um, apparently, um, a few people are interested. <laughs> But uh, it's not it's not uh, catchy. Most people are really not interested in talking about methods and metrics. Um, 
mean, uh, Gregory Bateson's daughter, Nora Bateson, with her coining the word warm data in these times where big data was, is so popular and most big data is cold data, is the uh, analytical, quantifiable data that is expressed in p-values of statistics. And um, what, what Nora is pointing out is that, um, I mean, we know from psychology that even, even scientists, most of them would deny it afterwards, make most of their great discoveries through intuitive hunches and um, leaps of imagination. And then they go back and do the hard work to do the science to prove what they've um, already intuited. And then once they've mm -hmm. got all that science done, they write it up in a way where they kind of don't mention the intuition in the first place. They just, we did all these analysis and then, yeah. And, um, and what Nora is pointing out is, is that just as on the individual basis also, we, we tend to make a decision in a holistic way. And then we use the intellectual mind to ra rationalize why we made that decision rather than we rationalize and then come to a decision. And, and this, this need for paying attention to what Nora calls warm data, which is the transcontextual data that does draw on science, does draw on all the quantitative data, but also uses the kind of our other senses, um, sensing, feeling, and intuiting um, to really integrate and make sense of the different disciplines, the different data sets, the different perspectives, and and I think we're, we're I, I completely hear that there's there's a role to influence bureaucrats and and um, particularly the legal system, the policy makers, the the, the, the governance way. Um, for me, the the other end of the spectrum, this kind of what you would maybe called spiritual, how do we fit in, who are we, where are we going, are also key narratives that actually influence how these people see the world. So influencing culture through art, through um, music, through dance, through all these other modalities that we have as human beings will eventually create a new cultural context that even those technocrats will then swim in. And and so um, that's what that for me it's always been like I came from science and went to holistic science and then to design, um, so I I try to bring that bridge, and yes I think a lot of what I do now, had I done that in the nineties and and early two thousands, people would have shot me down for being too on the edge of um, spiritual because that was a and some academic circles still is a bad word, but I think we're beginning to understand now that precisely these, what is the deeper meaning of it all is something that people are really grappling with, whether they call it, dare to call it spirituality, or whether they just call it worldview and and um, something necessary for well-being to have a, a deeper context of meaning. Um, Again, that that's just playing with the nuances of language, so we can speak to different people who are not able to see beyond their cultural context and therefore get triggered. Yeah. By words. But um, we that doesn't deal with real world social change. Mm -hmm. uh, that you can have in times of security, you can have very positive social change. But any naughty government or successful politician can scare everybody and they'll jettison their values and become selfish. And um, we need, as well as uh, that work, we also need to look at our our actual decision making systems and how they're and design and systems and how they're uh, causing problems. Like, for example, I've done a lot of uh, critiques of green building rating tools. Um, <clears throat> like lead actually, 
That was at, probably after the Green Building Council uh, representative tried to get me fired for saying green buildings weren't sustainable. Um, but I've done critiques and um, I developed an app that was based on this critique of about three dozen fundamental flaws with rating tools. Now, rating tools have had a big positive impact in making develop sustainable development something seen as good by developers. That was a phenomenal shift. But the tools themselves are blocking in very unsustainable development. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and then they're called regenerative or living or even net positive buildings. And I mean, I've seen a lot of living buildings that were inspired by nature that are sterile and destructive uh, and not even probably very good for human health, you know, in the sense that they don't expose people to nature and, and uh, community and other things. So yeah, it's, um, so I, I, based on that analysis, developed a tool that reverses all those flaws. If you, if you Google, you'll see lists of things that are wrong with green building tools, but they're very superficial. They're not the fundamental ones. And um, for instance, they'll say, well, ra green rating tools don't really look enough at social issues. Well, that's not a fundamental flaw because you could just add social criteria. Where would people, um, what would people find uh, more about the app? Like what, 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 could you send me a link to the app so I can put it in? The uh, um, you would, you would, you would have it because mm -hmm. I sent you some stuff. It's HTTP colon slash slash net positive design dot org. I think it's also sustainability dot org. But anyway, um, it, look, it, it's a visualization of cumulative impacts, but one of the fundamental things that's different about it is that it's the only tool that actually measures net positive because it measures negative, restorative, and net positive. But zero is um, sustainable conditions. It's not zero impact. Mm -hmm. So, um, you have to do better than no harm. This whole Western ethic of do no harm is a very negative construct. Uh, and it does a lot of harm, actually. The, uh, I, so it's a completely, the, the, go the, ahead. That's because I, I wanted, you just gave me a link to some somebody I wanted to mention earlier because of your work with, because in many ways, when you started speaking about um, the need to change constitutional law in different places in order to really anchor a new relationship um, with the more than human environment. Um, the, it, again, you were pioneering this at a time where um, Thomas Berry and, and some of these people were starting this notion of earth jurisprudence that then got taken up by lawyers like, um, uh, what's it called, Mike Cull Cullingham, or, um, I always get his name a little slightly wrong, but, but um, there's now this whole body, like there's the Alliance for the Rights of Nature, there's um, the the work that then Polly Higgins started to do where she, um, at, at the UN, tried to make um, species side or environmental side, eco side, um, a crime against humanity in order to create that whole legal tree all the way down into national uh, laws with regard to um, what what we need to enshrine in nature, like the the rights the rights of more than human nature, the the rights of a river system, the rights of a mountain, um, now being pioneered in, in New Zealand and a number of other places mm -hmm. where where people. Um, whether the indigenous constitutions also still count and and so you you can you can work in in that way or um uh i think um is it ecuador who started 
to rewrite its constitution to include rights of nature. So it, and in, in that context, the, the kind of ethical baseline, which I would love to hear your opinion on because of what you just said, um, Aldo Leopold's land ethic is in many ways a Western formalization of ancient indigenous practice of how to live in right relationships. Uh, a thing is right yeah. if it preserves the um, integrity, um, diversity, and health of the biotic community. Is it, it, it is wrong if it does otherwise. Very simple statement. But would you say that statement falls into that critique that, that you were just making? Or would you say that's beyond? Probably, probably yes, because um, if you're talking about the built environment in particular, um, you can't just say, you can't just draw boundaries and say, well, um, we're we're leaving the site better than we found it or better than it was at a certain point in time. We really have to address uh, the global level. We have to do do completely change our thinking. And there are ways of doing that. I've argued in my 2020 book, Net Positive Design, that it is, well, actually I've been trying for 20 years to sort of show that net positive development is possible. And uh, there, so there's really sort of that, that idea. I was exposed to Leopold's thinking when I was a child. Uh, I didn't read the book. Um, uh, and I, I remember hearing the intrinsic value of nature as a child, and it just struck me as, as right, you know, even though I was ignorant. Uh, it meant something to me, and the and the term land ethic didn't really know. I did know what it meant, you know, even as a kid, although I didn't have any background. And I think that it was a big influence on me. Um, but um, Ald Aldo Leopold is probably a little out of date now. I mean, he wrote his work in 1949. Yeah. Um, County Almanac. You know, yeah, uh, pretty, you know, I would never um, want, never want to say anything critical about Aldo Leopold, but I think that things have changed. Um, the population has at least doubled or tripled oh. in my mother's lifetime and doubled in mine or whatever. Um you know, it's just a completely different ballpark. We we knew um, we knew there was terrible pollution and that sort of thing, but the scale was just multiplied. So I think every development has to uh, contribute to uh, sustainability, social justice, and nature. Um, and that means too that every building has to be designed for retro, for eco positive retrofitting or for adaptive uh, change modification, because the environment changes, clients and occupants change, technology, society changes, climates change, and uh, we can't just keep knocking down buildings every 20 years when we've got a better use for the land. Uh, so that means that in itself is a total paradigm shift because we're durability at a certain level makes sense. Um, but but not throw, durable throwaway parts, you know, I mean, it's really got to be re reconsidered. And the but, other thing is you can't really have they just brief, briefly, sorry, um, they, they, just to also vindicate that there is a real role for statistical analysis and, and, and quantitative data. Um, for me, one thing that really rammed what you were just saying home in a, in a new way, although I knew 
the overall statement was right, but then to actually get this data was, I think it was in 2008, Cambridge University published a um, report on the built environment in the UK. And they just, this one piece of data that, that really just surprised me at the time was that they were saying 80% of all the built environment that will be in the UK in 2050 already exists today. And it brought home to me that all these kind of wonderful fancy architects who might even say, no, we, we don't build on greenfield sites anymore. We only build on brownfield sites and then we do a kind of living building, la, 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 la. But it's still all singing and dancing. And look at me, ego architect. I have created this beautiful thing, building. Exactly. <laughs> And and yeah, I, I I call it I call it wank architecture. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Or maybe that's an Australian uh, Australian term. No. Um, yeah, and as I said, living buildings are often sterile, and they'll say if you look at an architecture journal, they'll say this building was inspired by nature. And I've actually seen a picture of a very similar building in another country. You know, they got it from a magazine. They were inspired by an architectural magazine. Um, it's stylistic. Um, so people were not interested in retrofitting. Um, I, I wrote papers sort of trying to prove that they saved the public money in medical costs. And there, there are many people actually have shown that retrofitting makes money. I think in 1995, um, someone with the, I think at the time with the Rocky Mountain Institute showed just on a very practical level, took a typical home and, and showed the costs and payback of simple retrofits. Um, uh, we've known that for a long time, but they've ignored biodiversity. There's many opportunities to have uh, passive solar retrofits that uh, support biodiversity and life quality while um, uh, improving the energy efficiency and that sort of thing of a the lighting, the natural lighting of of a building. Uh, so yeah, there's. Go ahead. I I mean, I'm aware that you were going somewhere earlier, and then I cut you off. And you know, if you remember where you were going, I'd love to hear that. Um, but there's one thing before we've got got another fifteen twenty minutes or so. Um, one thing that I would love to come back to that I would really love your um, perspective on because you, you spend so much time in this field. We, we skirted on governance a couple of times. And um, what, what I am observing right now is that a lot of well-meaning people from the particularly the, the California tech crowd that um, believes that all salvation is in just harnessing exponential technologies and service to humanity and nature. And they really believe it because they're so st stuck in, in technology is the solution or even the, the self um, reinforcing narrative of exponential tech we we can't do anything about it it is going to run away so we might as well try to influence it that, that kind of justification and and a subset of those people have also caught on to that oh it's all about governance and then there's there's these crypto technologies that are behind a lot of these crypto um currencies out there now that people make quick money with and and have created another casino with um that is actually quite destructive to the planet as well um and these people have this theory of change that says now that we have ai now that we have ubiquitous computing um we can make everybody participate in every decision we can create these systems of governance where everybody gets the right to 
opinionate or even influence directly political decision making. But what that perspective is completely blind to is that we know already that algorithms used by companies like Cambridge Analytics have influenced national elections, that our entire management of our attention and our opinion is actively being influenced by how these social media likes and dislikes and kind of reward systems that are kind of going straight into our limbic system and play with our deep animal nature in influencing us can can be used to sway public opinion in in flash and so it is actually really really dangerous the idea that every tom dick and harry on jane and uh, whatever julia and patricia um can opinionate on everything even if they don't have a deep understanding of the context how do we get past that like yeah. we don't want the culture of experts that are narrow-minded because they're educated 30 years ago in a stale ivory tower university but we also don't want um this kind of sign like that this this governance system that would open itself to demagogues and manipulation in a way that people seem to be completely blase of at the moment and would yeah. yeah what's your what's your take on that well i agree completely i i think that um i mean one one approach there's no one solution of course is that if you create environments that are essentially very healthy and self-sufficient and and secure um there's going to be people will be less subject to manipulation because they won't have they can't be made hungry overnight by an engineered plague or uh, uh, run on banks or whatever is happening at, at the time. In other words, these things happen naturally or some could some evil force could uh, and have in the past done things to scare people uh, so that they'll uh, behave more conservatively or whatever. Um, so if you design environments in cities where no one has to worry about being homeless or running out of food, um, that then things, democracy, that's the only way really you can have a democracy <laughs> is where people are secure. And um, there needs to be more things like reason debates and juries rather than just marketing right now the loudest voice wins um and of course there's a lot of manipulation and ai now can can put words in the mouths of people that they've never said you know in videos and and that sort of thing so um i think that that's that's a big part of it um but as to what what do you do about crypto and ai that's really a little outside my pay grade you know um and also uh i've been i've been having conversations with chat gpt and uh, very pleasant um person or whatever to talk to, uh, but really ignorant of sustainability. So even in that context, you only get the mainstream view. In other words, what you hear about sustainability will still be the Brundtland report, um, which was a little bit regressive 40 years ago. Uh, so yeah, it, it's really um, a massive problem. 
in terms of the governance, because because you do in your work, or the the part that I'm I'm most familiar with, um, there there seem to have been this core argument that in order to create these participatory environments, we need to give people like the the, the political notion of subsidiarity that that decisions should be made at the scale where people are influenced by those decisions and so basically at the local and regional scale and um all higher forms of government at national or international level should be subsidiary it, cr supporting the coordination between these regional um constituencies where people decide what what they try to do in their region um we do need global agreements on how to regenerate um, ecosystems everywhere around the planet or bioregional watersheds um, everywhere around the planet. But the actual action of becoming a regenerative expression of place again has to be at the local and regional scale. How how do you see this this notion of place and and local and regional fit into your after all, this this long trajectory of, of looking at environmental planning and law and governance um what's your take on that and and, and how do how do you see the importance well of i haven't values? i haven't really uh changed my mind about those things but i do think the context is changing as you were just pointing out mm -hmm. and I, I think we need to revisit everything in that reality um and also in you know as i said in my work with low-income community groups or just trying to help a community get a playground built the forces of darkness are always there you know there's always a few that really understand the idea of a nature playground um, and how that can contribute to biodiversity and get children to really experience nature while developing their motor, motor and social skills and all those things. But the powerful forces um, block that. And, and uh, there's even manipulation at that scale. I remember that uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm for a playground at my kid's school, but it became this big uh, political thing where people thought that I'd gone out and gotten the grant. That So it was free money. It was quite a bit of money. And people were saying, that should be spent on a new toilet block, you know? And they were stirring up. And then I did this nice thing that uh, the drainage wasn't very good. And I think I asked the council if they could improve the drainage. Well, they just tore up half the site and put in a huge concrete culvert. In other words, way over-engineered it, spent more money than the three playgrounds around the school cost. You know, like, and anything you do today involves those kinds of unexpected hassles. Uh, I mean, I named just two on on one playground out of many hassles. Um, I think, you know, a lot of this is where, where society is just moving too fast. Um, and anything you do to try to improve the system causes uh, pushback and reactions and misfits, you know, between what you're trying to do and the system. I used to say that play gardens were a metaphor for sustainability because you're trying to do something for education, community, child health, nature, all these sustainability things, and yet all these barriers would come out, social, political, uh, even health and safety, technocratic. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, uh, actually, well, conventional playgrounds were a lot, a lot less um, safe. Um, that's well, tell, well, one, one... I'm just thinking of the playground that my daughter, my daughter was in, invited to another six-year-old's birthday party yesterday, and it was at a big, recently constructed playground here in the city of Palma de Mallorca, and. Um, as you were speaking, I, I envision briefly let my mind go into what would a really nature like experience playground look like. And while the playground that we were at yesterday is a playground where they can run around and they can climb things and they can slide down things and, and so on. But there's this sort of area which looks a bit like a golfing green with bunkers and and and, and so on. Oh, but yeah, that's all some form of spongy, not astroturf, but like fake grass. Um, and yeah, and then then I was thinking, ah, yeah, but if you try to do that with all natural, and that many kids would run around, and it, it would soon be a dirt pit rather than grass. And 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 no, then, oh well, that no, that, no. Yeah, yeah. well. I'm um i um i'm i'm did a playground where you know it's almost invisible because the original you're not plopping in equipment you're you're it's all from scratch but it's low and it's challenging it's designed to challenge in different ways yet be much safer than an ordinary playground and Kids like cubbies. They if they fall, a plant is soft and will protect them from injury. So it's not like falling on a harder surface, but it's designed to be fall. It's a plant selected that might so it can be uh, someone could fall on it. Uh, this was many years ago, and and I and a landscape person went to for some reason to talk to someone at the council. And he said, plants and playgrounds don't mix. And my friend, the landscaper said, well, have you seen the playground, you know, which was growing very fast. And he said, no, but that just proves my point. In other words, he was dead wrong. The plants survived because they were a part of the play. They created cubbies, uh, shade, just interesting hiding, hide seek places. Mm -hmm. And uh, it changed every day, too. Every year, of course, it was much. And it, it actually worked pretty well because even though the parents, volunteers, put all the plants in the wrong places, you know, where you're supposed to have a hanging plant they put a big tree that mm -hmm. so it was totally wrong but it still worked um and uh, what happened was in a in a few years and they wouldn't maintain it because they had in the budget money to maintain mechanical equipment and rose gardens but they would not budget to uh, make sure the playground stayed maintained. And then some playground rules came out because conventional playgrounds are actually very dangerous. You have two swings for a thousand kids and the kids are bored. So they jump off and they break a leg or they're, or, you know, so they're, uh, I proved as a young master student, they weren't safe at all. Uh, let alone per capita. Um, even though, so they wrote a set of very prescriptive rules saying like wherever you have to deck, you have to have a one meter high rail. Well, that means that instead of having a staggered deck where people will could fall, but it's designed to fall safely. Instead, you put a meter high rail the kids will balance on the rail they'll fall and hit their head on the rail um so it was really stupid so that's when i got out of the playground uh, uh department because it it was um the rules made play environments unsafe and we're probably uh, 
I think we're probably um, done. To, to wrap up, I'd love to do another conversation sometime because the, this 90 minute went, went past in a, in a flash. But I thought one way of ending would be with, with you, the wisdom of hindsight and foresight of what you see coming. Like um, we mentioned Mumford earlier and Mumford had this, this like he, he mapped out two possible futures for us with regard to the built environment. One, one of them was um, the dystopian future of where he saw things were getting. Um, and the other one, um, he called utopian to not call it utopian because utopian is no place a place that will never exist and utopia is a good place a future where um life can flourish and therefore we as part of life can flourish um are you hopeful what would be your advice to us if like all all things are often you're talking to humanity to advise it from your learning of of a, of a lifetime what do we need to do differently how do we get from dystopia to utopia right we got to do everything we, we got to do the exact opposite of what we're doing now that's what my um my work has been about is just saying what's wrong and gee the opposite of that would work um but i'm not the one to ask about dystopian futures because uh, I have this sort of perfect life and a rural property uh, in regional Victoria. Uh, I've always had some kind of euphoric gene. So even when I'm upset, I'm always deliriously happy. Um, I can't really worry about the earth. I as long as I'm doing everything I can to try to save the planet, then I have a lot of limitations. But but if I feel honestly I'm doing all I can, um, then then what more can I do? So um, I think it's good for people's me mental health. I've heard a lot about depression. And um, in, in recent years, and I really, I don't want to trivialize it, but I think if you go out and try to save the planet, you'll feel better. That's not going to solve all the personal problems that people have. Um, but uh, as I said in my first book, saving the planet is fun and we should all, you know, do it. Um, it's it's very rewarding and even though i'm really pained by the loss of biodiversity and and these amazing cultures that existed when i was young um around the world uh we could be hit by a gamma ray tomorrow and not even know it so um you know i don't really worry about that like because I really can't do anything about it. Um, so it's terrible, but it's just the way things are. And um, I'm still going to enjoy life. Um, you know, I think uh, I think the earth is heaven. Wow, beautiful. Quite literally. Yeah. We that's what we forgot. And a lot of little a lot of little fallen angels running mm -hmm. around. Beautiful. Uh, that's but what can you do? What can you do but do yeah. the best you but, can? exactly as you said. Yeah, that's all you and, and also yeah, that's all you can do. And I appreciate that you, you you named your own privilege because that's of course the same with me. Like we we all have been able to do what we've done so far in our lives because we've come from a certain level of privilege to with access to education and so on and 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 now are somewhat comfortable to but 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 that doesn't mean that because now that we have live in this cancel culture it's so easy to then just oh white upper middle class over educated and then male um forget about him that those kind of people got us into the trouble in the first place 
that that's cancel culture too. It depends on how mm -hmm. we use our privilege. Um, I could have used mm -hmm. three languages and um, the level of education to simply focus on making as much money as, as I could. And instead, I've spent 20 years with NGOs and grassroots movement um, working for meaning rather than money. And, and but that's, that is what made, for a large extent of that time, made Earth heaven to me. Uh, I, I love that, that framing. Um, yes, we, we live in the middle of paradise. We just need to learn to see it again. And, um, and the more of us learn to see it, the more it will spread as a cultural um, perspective that um, be grateful for what you have and do the best you can for it. And the rest is beyond us and there will always be uncertainty and yeah, yeah. and um well let's just hope we're around to see whatever happens yes for a while this has been an absolute gift and i'm sh sure we'll, we'll um get back in touch soon and and um won't take as long as we took to make this call happen. I think we've been talking about it for about two years. So thank you so much. It was worth yeah, it. Was uh, great. Okay. Well, thank you. It's uh, entirely my pleasure. And I hope to talk to you again soon. Yes. So, have, a, have, a lovely, have a lovely evening. Good, good night. Bye. Okay. Night.